think we're going to go ahead and get started. All right. Well, uh, I wanted to thank everybody for being here. Um, my name is Drew Bennett. I'm one of the third year residents. And I uh, just wanted to start by saying a couple of things. I wanted to, um, to thank several people. Um, obviously, Dr. Higgins and the department for allowing some time to share today. Um, Susan Colstrom, she's still here. Yeah. Susan was um, very instrumental in making this trip possible. Um, since um, repetitive um, requests for funds and trying to, to make all this stuff work, and she was very patient with that. We've got a lot of other people who are, are joining. I tried to extend an invitation to a lot of our staff on labor and delivery, postpartum, APT. See Stacy's in the back um, from the OR. Um, we've got. See Heidi, Donna's here, Joan's here, Dr. Miller's here, uh, Michelle, and her wife, her husband Chris, um, from postpartum, and then got some of our colleagues from um, emergency medicine in the back. So thank you everybody for being here. What I wanted to talk about today is um, the CMC Global Health Initiative, and this is something that um, has kind of um, becoming more of a formalized process uh, over the last um, really six to nine months. And I want to talk to several groups of people. I want to share a little bit about um, our recent trip to to Cameroon, um, Dr. Higgins and my wife Tina and I were able to go, and I don't know if you guys still meet Tina, she's in the back, um, a lot of you know her, so um, she's here and was able to drop the kids off and be here, so I want to share about that trip, I want to talk to the residents specifically about um, the global health location that we've been able to set up through the Department of Med Ed, and then something I'm really excited about, I want to talk about the possibility of doing some multidisciplinary trips um, in the next couple years with some of our colleagues in nursing. Um, and maybe some of the other um, residency programs that we have there. So that's kind of where we're headed. Um, our objectives here, um, we talked about that. Um, for the residents, I want to talk about the timing, um, the cost, some of the details involved in going. Um, and same thing as well for some of the nurses um, and other support staff. I want to talk about what it would look like uh, to take a trip over to Cameroon and what would be involved. Lots of pictures here. And just for the residents, show of hands, who was able to hear Dr. Higgins talk? Most, most folks? Maybe half. Okay. I just want to know where we're starting from. Um, I did not want to repeat what he's done, um, but I do want to show lots of pictures and, and really give you guys a good idea of what it was like over there and, and what to expect. Um, so in terms of the Global Health um, Initiative, it's pretty neat. There's nine physicians listed up, he listed up here. Um, Dr. Higgins, myself, um, Dr. Jill R. Young, who's in the back. She's one of our emergency medicine fellows. Um, he spent uh, two years um, in Africa um, at Mbingo Hospital with his family and has been back since. Chuck Ferrier is um, internal medicine faculty here. Um, his wife, Angela, um, they have also spent two years uh, at the same hospital. Um, and after they leave tomorrow, they take two a day right to his back. So he took um, Todd Gandy and Lucy Jane earlier this year, and he's going back with Priscilla and Julie to Costa, and they leave tomorrow. So within the last 18 months, nine of our um, physician from CMC has spent time at this hospital, which is pretty incredible. Um, I did not know DR, JLR, I did not know Chuck um, before I booked my ticket for Cameroon, and that all kind of happened after the fact. So there's a neat partnership that is really starting to be created um, with our hospital and theirs, and I think that's one of the things that we really need to leverage um, and try to, to make this happen more. So you, um, most of you guys were able to hear um, Carol Locher speak. Um, Carol spoke about a year ago. She's one of our former residents. She graduated in 1982. Um, Dr. Higgins helped train her. And uh, she spoke last year about her experience in Cameroon. She lives there with her husband and their five kids. Um, three of her kids are in the States now. Two are still there. And um, she's been there 17 years. Um, for most of that time, has volunteered her services uh, medically, working at different primary care clinics. Um, most recently, she's been working at um, a hospital in the mountains of Cameroon, um, offering her services in OBGYN. She works in a clinic there, she does surgery, she helps out on the maternity ward. When she spoke a year ago, um, it really sparked my interest about wanting to do something like this. Um, Hannah and I have talked for a long, long time, um, even before medical school, about wanting to, um, to give our time and, and hopefully our talents to meet people's um, physical needs, emotional needs, spiritual needs here in our community and then around the world. And so um, when Carol spoke and, and spoke about the opportunities over there, I wanted to try to make that happen, and kind of one thing fell into place after another, and we were able to go this past January. So um, truly remarkable, and um, I'm very thankful that it worked out the way it did. So I want to tell you a little bit about where we were at. We're in the country of Cameroon. You can see the entire African continent there. Um, Cameroon's on the west coast. 
it's um, it's very close, about as close as you can get to the equator and the prime meridian, so it's very tropical, it's a very temperate climate. They have a dry season and a wet season. And I'll show you a picture of the, um, the country itself in a second. Up in the mountains toward the northern part, uh, northwestern part of the continent, excuse me, part of the country, you have Mbingo Baptist Hospital. And um, it's a truly unique place um, that's doing things that, that really nowhere else in the world is doing. It's incredible. So here's, um, here's Africa. Um, you can see Cameroon is in yellow. Um, if you look to the, to the east coast, Kenya is also in yellow, and Tanzania is below that. Cameroon is bordered by Nigeria to the north, Gabon, um, a very small country to the south. Um, Cameroon itself, pictured on the left, there's three big cities, um, primarily Douala is the capital, and that's where we flew into. Um, it's the larger city, it's a port city. Um, to the east, you have Yondo. Yondo is the capital. Um, slightly smaller, um, but still a very busy city. And then as you move north up into the mountains, you get to Gamunda. Gamunda is a city of about a half a million people. Um, fairly large, um, very busy city as well. And then if you go an hour north of that, um, then you get to the little community of Mbingo. So that's where we were at. We hopped on a plane um, stateside. Um, this in all was about a two and a half day journey. Um, traveled over, you can either go through um, through Paris or through Brussels. Um, we went through Paris um, and then caught a flight um, down to Douala. So it took a little bit um, a little bit of time to get there, but it was well worth the wait. Next, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, what we saw, what we did, what the travel was like, um, and what to expect if this is something that you were thinking about doing. So um, on the left is the Douala Airport. It's an open air airport, very very small. Um, we essentially showed up um, not knowing anybody. We didn't know if our bags were going to get there. Eventually they did, and we were picked up by a very strange man by the name of Fawn. And uh, Fawn speaks some English, not much, loaded us into a strange vehicle and drove us um, to a place we had no idea where we were going. So um, Fawn was very, very nice. He was actually wearing a, a Wofford uh, University hat, so I was feeling right at home from the beginning. Um, from there, um, they dropped us off. We had a meal at one of the common restaurants a lot of the tourists eat at downtown. And then they drove us to this compound. Um, there's a picture of it there to the right. Um, but we drove to this compound initially uh, at nighttime. And um, it was very, very ominous of feeling. I felt like I was Jason Bourne. Um, they drive us up. Fawn lays on the horn. And a very strange looking man in bare feet comes out and lets us in. And uh, at that point, I thought we might be done for. I didn't know if we were going to make it the next day. <laughs> but um, where they had taken us was the rest house. Um, we got in late that afternoon. Um, driving at night in Cameroon um, is not safe. The roads are very bad. The vehicles break down, um, not infrequently. And so if you break down in the middle of the road in the middle of the night, um, it's not a good place to be. So uh, we stay at the rest house. There's a picture of it there. It's not near as scary as it looks from the outside. Uh, there's a picture of a bedroom, very nice bedroom. They have what they call an, an airco, which is an air conditioner, uh, which is a luxury in most parts of Cameroon. You have a bathroom. Um, you have a lot of mosquito spray. And um, I don't think we slept very much that first night. Um, neither Hannah or I. We were, we were a little restless. Picture of the rest house. Um, one of the rooms there is very, um, very nice, actually, by Cameroon standards. We had breakfast the next morning. They have a patio that overlooks a port. Um, Douala, like I said, is a port city. Um, it's their major trade center. Um, and you can actually see the water. Um, the picture on the right is a picture from the hospital itself. And I'll show a couple more pictures of that in just a second. Um, Douala, again, you can see the, um, the water in the background. Douala is a very, very busy city. The living conditions are, are poor, typical of what you would expect in a lot of third world countries. Um, there are a few cars, but a lot of people get by. Um, terms of transportation with motorbikes or, or by walking. Very, very busy, um, very, very crowded place. Um, it was quite an eye-opening experience to, uh, to start our trip there. Um, I hadn't spent much time, um, really any time out of the country, um, aside from a brief trip to Mexico. So this was a new experience for me and, um, and something that was, was very eye-opening. So um, Fawn did come back. He picked us up the next morning, um, and we loaded up, and we made the seven-hour trip so from Douala, if you remember that back to that picture, Douala is on the port uh, and on the coast. You go seven hours, um, which is only a distance of 180 miles. So it took less than three hours here, but 180 miles took seven hours um, to get up to the hospital. So we rode in that, in that van. It was a very, very bumpy ride. 
um, in the end we made it. The streets are very busy. You can see a picture of that here. 95% um, of the cars in San Marino are Toyota Corolla. Um, I don't know why. I asked our driver, and I think it has something to do with the repairs are cheap and the cars are reliable, but I've never seen so many Toyota Corollas in my life, and they're all painted. Uh, you can't really see it here, but they all have very, uh, very bright paint jobs. Um, a lot of motorbikes, very, very busy. A lot of street vendors, a lot of traffic. Not only do you have vehicles, you have bicycles, motorbikes, you have cows on the road. Um, it's just a, it's a crazy, crazy place. Then you've got your local fair. There's um, roadside vendors everywhere. They're selling possums and porcupine and snakes, um, all kinds of things. The people there are so resourceful. They're trying to do anything they can um, to make a penny or two, to make enough to, to feed their family for another meal. So um, if you have um, anything that's sharp, um, be it a stall or even just a sharp rock, you will take that and you will um, chop up sticks and you'll bundle them up and you'll sell them for profit. Um, and that might be your business. Um, so it's, a, it's amazing how hard these people work and just to try and get by. As we got further out into the, um, to the countryside, we start to see some schools and some smaller communities. Um, the children there are amazing. Um, they're very, very happy. Um, they're singing, they're dancing all the time. Um, most of them will walk um, upwards of a mile to a mile and a half one way to go to school. Um, that process for them can take hours. Um, they'll go to school from eight or nine in the morning till two or three at night. Um, and so you'll just see children walking for miles and miles and miles. It's incredible. Um, unfortunately, it can be dangerous for them. There was one point where we were driving and one of the kids had been hit by one of the local taxi vans and this huge chase en ensued. There was a, a motorbike um, and three men on this motorbike that were trying to chase this man down. And we were kind of in the middle of it. The motorbike came flying by us on the left and um, we weren't sure what was happening. We stopped at um, one of the, the road stops where you pay the toll and they told us what was going on. And in the end, what happened is the driver of the taxi pulled over um, at a roadside store and turned himself into the police. And I was asking why that happened, and, and the driver told me that it was for fear of, of jungle justice. Um, but it had he not, that these men would have tracked him down and beat him and, and left him in the bush to die. So uh, it's a different place. The justice system there is very different um, at that mine stand. So that was a, a little insight into, into what life was like for many of these people. Here's a picture of a lot of the living conditions. This is um, not your typical for a lot of um, the families there. Excuse me. <coughs> um, each family will have a very small plot of land, and on, on that plot of land will be a house. Um, houses like these will, will house two, sometimes three generations, um, sometimes six, eight, ten, um, twelve people will live in some um, a little area flat like this. Um, so it, it truly is, is, is very different than anything we'll ever see in life. Again, more pictures of housing. Um, a lot of people, the families will have a plot for their house, and they'll also have a farm somewhere. And it's a small plot of land um, that their family owns, and they will farm um, anything that they can grow. Whatever they grow in surplus, they will sell again for profit. So I think you saw a picture um, a second ago. These are um, potatoes. Um, this family is, is they're farming potatoes, and whatever they don't eat, they will either save and barter or they'll sell. So again, they're very hardworking people. Um, it's incredible to watch um, to watch how they live day in and day out. All those um, fields are, are plowed by hand. This is a stick that was carved that we found on the side of the road, and, and that says there's a hoe. Um, that's all they've got, and, and yet the rows are meticulously rolled, um, and it's am it's amazing what they're able to do so much with so little. see things on s um, for sale um, on the side of the road. Here's diesel gasoline, some gourds, and some miscellaneous fruit. Um, things like this are, are all over. Again, just some pictures of the resourcefulness. Um, there's more on top of that van um, than there is in the van itself. Um, how they get that stuff tied down and how they get it to stay down, I have no idea. It's incredible. Picture of one of the taxi buses that I spoke of. Um, here we are. We're stopped at a roadside market. Our driver at a farm stopped to get some food and when you stop, you just get mobbed by people. Um, you might have four or five different people trying to sell pineapple. Well, if you're selling pineapple, you need to be the first one there um, in case somebody wants to buy some because that might be your only profit for the day. So people are very, very desperate for any type of, um, any type of income, any, any, any type of source of, of anything to help their family survive. 
So once we arrived in Berminda, um, we were introduced to the CDC Health Services System. CDC is Carolina's Baptist Convention. It is a faith-based organization that's been in Cameroon for a long time. The health care in Cameroon, as in many countries like it, is very poor. And so um, a while back, the uh, Minister of Health um, in the Cameroon federal government started to partner with the CDC to help offer care to many of the people in the country that were not able to have it otherwise. And so the CDC has been um, a, a big factor. They um, coordinate health care. They coordinate schools within the country of Cameroon, and they have their health services arm um, that coordinates volunteers from all over the world. Um, and it was wonderful working with them. Every year they bring in over 300 volunteers from people all over the world, from places, excuse me, all over the world. Um, around 280 of those will go to the hospital that we were at. Um, so we always felt safe uh, when they took us to the West House, when we were driving on these, uh, on these foreign roads, um, having to get through checkpoints and military stops, things like that. Um, these guys were awesome. And so in terms of safety, you're absolutely safe. They're very, very good at what they do. They take very, very good care of you. Um, and so uh, I think it's a, a very good system in that regard. So finally, after almost three days, we arrived. We finally make it to Cameroon. Um, and this is a picture of the little apartment where we stayed. Um, the lady you see there, her name is Constance. She would help um, wash the tiles or she would help cook some of the meals. She was very, very nice. I'll show you some pictures of the inside of the room. If you go down that sidewalk to the end is the dining hall. The dining hall would fit about 20, 30 people. Um, you'd have three meals a day. Um, it was sometimes pretty typical what you see here at the banquet. Other times it was very plain food. I mean, they bring out fish that's fried, bone and all, and they have it cut off. And um, that was for dinner that night. And um, I, w I left the table pretty hungry after that. <laughs> I think Dr. Higgins ate quite a bit more of that than I did. So just pictures of kind of living conditions there. Um, little blue tin bags. We had a bathroom, um, running water. Um, we take showers. They recommend you don't drink the water there, but there are plenty of bottled waters behind it. And that's uh, from our front porch. So um, I'll show you the picture in a second, but um, the hospital itself is really on the edge of the mountains, and so you, you're basically looking down in a valley. Um, it's a beautiful place, um, absolutely incredible. So here's a picture of uh, kind of an aerial shot of the hospital. Um, the hospital is very large, 300 beds. Um, they do a ton of surgery. They do 9,000 surgeries a year. Last year they set a record and did 10,000 cases. 30% of that is UIM surgery. They've got 20 beds in their um, maternity unit. They've got four labor room beds, two delivery beds. Their um, surgical recovery unit has 70 beds. They have an ICU now, which is two years old. Um, they see over 70,000 patients in their clinic. And um, so these guys are very, very busy. And um, it's, it's an, an neat place. It's incredible. They're in the, in the middle of the mountains. Um, the, the place is developed. And, and I'll share with you a little bit about the reasons why. But um, when you're looking at the hospital there, it's, it's like a central hub where you have your offices. And then that spokes on a wheel. There's different wards and different cl different clinics that, that come off of that. Um, a lot of other programs for officers and um, a couple other pictures I'll show you here in a second. So I want to talk about the history of the hospital because I think it's fascinating. So in 1952, um, the landlady donated to start a leprosy hospital. This is when leprosy was very common, and they wanted to find a remote place where these patients could receive care. And so that's how Mbingo, uh, or Bingo as the locals call it, came to be. In 1965, the CDC took over the supervision. The hospital by this time was starting to grow. There were fewer and fewer patients that were needing treatment for leprosy, and so there was free beds for other folks to come in. And so um, Bingo developed a reputation as being a referral hospital where people could come and get compassionate and high-quality care. In the 1990s, I drove from Berminda, so that hour drive from Berminda to Bingo uh, was paid. And so that opened up the door for now folks to come from Yanjo or from Douala or from Ford, so it's eight hours away, um, and to be able to get access to a hospital like this. And so the hospital continued to grow. In 2006, um, the PATH program, which is a general surgery residency training program, um, was moved to Bingo. And then two years later, the internal medicine training program for residents started there. And now you have um, a residency service um, with residents getting trained, and you have doctors who are coming from literally all over the world to help train these residents and volunteer their time. So you have a subspecialty surgeon, maybe a neurosurgeon coming from Washington State. And so he's able to offer procedure to some of these patients that nobody has been able to offer before. 
Dr. Higgins was the first UL oncologist um, that has ever been to Bingo. And so we're able to do radical hysterectomies and do tissue non-radical hysterectomies. And so um, the treatments that are being offered now um, are treatments that were never offered um, before and are really not offered since 1930 until the last time. In 2016, um, just this year, they started their first Helping Match Fellowship. Um, the Helping Match Fellow was Chris Gardner, and he was there, and, and he's a He's a remarkable surgeon, and um, so it's exciting to see what's happening. The hospital continues to get bigger and better. Here's a picture of the front of the hospital. You can see the reference of Hansen's disease there. I want to talk briefly about the PATH program. Uh, I think this is fascinating, and it really is inspiring. So in 1996, um, there was a man by the name of David Thompson, and um, he was a surgeon, general surgeon, who had spent his, most of his life and the latter part of his career in Gabon, just south of Cameroon, um, volunteering his time. He was getting late in his career, and he realized that um, if he were to retire, if he were to pass away, that everything that he had built would essentially vanish with him. And he also realized that there was this huge need, still this huge need for, for medical care and surgical care, especially on the African continent. And so what he did um, is he came up with the idea for PATH, and, and PATH is the Pan-African Academy of Christian Surgeons. And it was the first group that had really committed a vision to training local doctors that could meet some of the medical need in Africa. So started in his hospital in Gabon. Uh, the second hospital um, where this was started was in Bonso, which is actually in Cameroon itself. And then over time, it's developed into nine different hospitals all over the African continent with plans to expand up to three more um, in the next couple of years. So I think this slide is a couple years old, but as of now, there, there are still nine hospitals uh, where PATH surgeons are being trained. Since its inception in, in 1996, in the last 20 years, they've trained almost 40 surgeons and six pediatric um, fellows in general surgery. So I think they have, they have a goal to train, um, I think, 100 surgeons every year, 20 training. Uh, I think they're going to be a little shy of it, but they'll probably be close to 75 or 80 by the time they're done. So they're doing a, an amazing work, and these residents are absolutely incredible. They're some of the most amazing people I've ever met in my life. Um, I want to tell you about a couple of them, just so you understand, and, and this is – primarily for the residents, because these are the people that you get to work with. Um, Dr. Moses Kasambu, he's a fourth-year resident who was raised in Uganda. Um, he saw a huge medical need there. Um, there was tons of his family and friends um, that had medical conditions. They needed surgery, but there was no one there to do the surgery. So he said, I'm going to go into medicine. He pursued training two different times. One program closed. Um, the second time, he had to suspend his training because he had to go help support his family. And uh, in the end, was accepted to the PATH program to do a dent. And um, by many, he's considered the best surgeon in the hospital. He's very, very gifted. And he plans to return to Uganda when he's done. You can see him smiling in the picture. He's one of the happiest, happiest guys I've ever met in his life. Um, he's been through so much. Um, he actually lives apart from his wife and a six-year-old daughter who are here in Ukraine. Um, the schools surrounding the hospital are very, very poor. Um, but he's so committed to this, and he's so committed to his training. Um, that he lives apart from them and only sees them once or twice a year. Dr. Keith Fiota, he's a chief resident. Um, he's from the Congo. Uh, he grew up in the midst of civil war, people dying around him left and right. Um, and so similar story, um, he realized that there's a huge need for surgeons. They're typically, in, in his region, four surgeons per six million people. That's incredible. Um, and so he wanted to answer that call. Um, he also had struggled uh, with his training for financial reasons, was given a, a scholarship through the PATH program, and he plans to return to Congo when he's done this year. And then Dr. James Joseph. Um, he is somebody that Anna and I know well. Uh, he became one of my good friends when I was there. He's a second-year resident. He's from the Sudan. Uh, similar story. Um, Dr. Joseph was a teenager when his mom went into labor with his sister. Um, his mom had obstructed labor, which is very common um, in Africa. His sister died shortly after birth. Probably from some sort of um, obstructive hypoxia syndrome. Um, so when James saw that, he said, I want to be a doctor and I want to help these people. During medical school, he watched a woman deliver um, and then had a postpartum hemorrhage. Um, she died from that. There was nobody who was able to do her hysterectomy. And so he said, I want more training and I want to be a surgeon. And so that's what he's committed his life to. Ironically, um, also in medical school, he um, was the only 
medical provider of any kind at a very remote clinic and I'm going to come in with an incarcerated and cramped bowel. And so um, having no training whatsoever, he said, this man's going to die. I'm going to do what I can. So he resuscitated this guy and I saved his life. And that's the kind of stuff um, that these guys do. And it's, it's absolutely incredible. It's like nothing I've ever heard. So he plans to return to Sudan when he's done. Um, just a, a kind of a reference to, to Obi and kind of what Obi is like. They, he, his wife, when we were there, they were pregnant with twins, and they were very, very excited about this. Um, and that's a high risk pregnancy here, um, and especially in Africa. So unfortunately, his wife, shortly after we left, um, broke her water, 26 weeks. And I think she stayed pregnant for maybe a week and then delivered. Um, so we had twin girls. One of the girls died very quickly. Um, amazingly, one of the girls is still living. Um, she is bleeding out her arm, which is incredible. Um, it's not very often that you see um, things like that in Africa. But um, they're going to return. They've been in Douala for the best case deals, and they're going to be coming back. But I think things are very soon. Here's Dr. Joseph. He's so happy now. It's crazy. And he sweats like a geek. <laughs> I don't know if you can see that. Um, that's like one case. I mean, he does that every time. <sighs> All right. You guys keep moving. So pictures of the hospital. There's the front of the hospital. Um, there's, if you basically turn around and look the other way, you see the mountains behind you. Um, picture of one of the wards. The ward is in there. Dr. Higgins called me from there and said, every person that comes into the hospital has to have a care taken for a family member that's with them. And um, so as you can imagine, there's very little room. These people will be all over the place, sitting on the side of the pavement. They'll be sleeping on the ground, outside, inside, on the concrete. It's amazing. There's people all over the place. Picture of the airship. Here's one of the worthwhile people there um, in an airplane. And you have a severe illness. I mean, it's a, it's a hospital sitting in front of a helipad. Similar picture um, from up there. That's on a hike that he went on up and down at the hospital just to give you the, the area that, that's up there in Sudan. Um, hospital's getting bigger and better. It's growing. It's amazing that this hospital exists in the middle of nowhere. So they have clean ORs now. They have an orthopedic room. They have a uh, plastic surgery room. The building that you see there, and then I'll show you in this next picture. Now that's a very big structure um, for African standards. I mean, they're one of the large internal medicine buildings that will have clinics and, and space for lectures and things like that. Um, they are um, doing additional surgical subspecialties, like I mentioned, with the head and neck fellowship. And then one thing that I think is truly remarkable is they're going to they're trying to build a multi-million dollar hydroelectric hydroelectric power plant um, to supply power um, to the hospital, which continues to be a, a big problem for them. So in the in the the valley where the hospital is located uh, during the rainy season, there's seven different waterfalls that are flowing, and they look just like the one on the right. That's the closest waterfall to the hospital. It's about half a mile away. Um, the picture on the left is what we saw. That's what the hospital looks like during the dry, the, the waterfall looks like during the dry season. And so what their plan is, there is a, another waterfall that runs year-round, and it's this one, and that's the picture that I took, um, and it still moves at a pretty good clip even when it's dry. So what they're, what they're talking about doing is, is rerouting water from this waterfall closer to the hospital um, to supply power. And that would be huge. That would allow them to do more surgically. While we were there, um, we burned up a couple of generators on our Dovey system because you have, you know, you have power surges when the generator kicks on or doesn't kick on or kicks on for a second and then shuts back off. Um, it's very, very difficult in our electrical equipment. It's very, very difficult when, you, when somebody's body, when the light goes out, to turn on some equipment. So um, that's not atypical. Usually it goes off for about 30 seconds and then the generator's kicking and comes back on. But um, power remains a big, big problem. Um, and something that they're looking to address. So it's pretty amazing that they're, they're able to do all that um, in the middle of a flash like this. Eventually we made it home. That's a picture on your car. So I was excited to see my boys and, and they were excited too. So um, I just wanna talk a little bit to the residents about um, what my experience was like, what you could um, anticipate and hopefully talk at least one or two of you um, into thinking about going back home. So what's it like for the residents? The opportunities are incredible. Um, the surgeries there, um, and I've shared with many of you as we've talked, is unlike anything I've ever seen. The complicated uterine surgery is ridiculous. I mean, every time I opened a belly, um, it was something crazy, whether it was poor NHPD, um, bad bad fibroids, bad cancer, chronic TLA, chronic ectopia. I mean, just every time. Um, the, the surgical experience is truly fantastic. We did um, a lot.
God of Adama who dwelt in the earth. We did um, Bible history lesson. Um, there's lots of opportunities for operative vacuum delivery. So they do have vacuums there. They have a huge um, cabinet full of forceps that have been um, donated um, by different obstetricians who have come. So plenty of opportunities to put blades on essentially anybody who has um, an indication. A lot of twin deliveries, incidence of twins is high in the African population. Um, vaginal bleep. Um, Dr. Higgins will vouch for this, but at one point we get called to test a patient 35 weeks, um, twins, we think they're gonna die. Um, she's ruptured two times, <coughs> excuse me, um, breech breech. And the midwife was like, oh, so you're going to have a vacuum delivery, right? And uh, <laughs> what? Um, we don't do that. And, uh, but they do a lot of vaginal deliveries. They, and in many cases, you know, there's studies that have showed that in many cases where you don't have good surgical support, they're taught to save her. Um, we do have fairly good surgical support in this hospital. Um, so we know the recommendation is for C-section and we deliver her by C-section, but tons of opportunities for vaginal breech delivery there. Um, they do have a developing laparoscopy program. Um, they, within the last couple months, they have um, won uh, laparoscopic power. They've done some cystos, they've done a couple of diagnostic laparoscopies. They do not have bipolar cauteries. Um, so you could get a couple of directions we could do some, some neat things in terms of laparoscopy there, and there's a lot of teaching opportunities. So that's something that they're just now starting to do. Um, advanced fluid pathology, pathology I talked about, and then lots of opportunities for research. So lots of sweet stuff um, that's going on there. Um, for residents, there's really four places you're gonna spend your time. You're gonna either be in the OR, and you're probably gonna be there a good bit. Um, during the first six days, I think we did 20 cases. Uh, we operated seven days a week. Um, we had plans not to operate one day, but inevitably something came in that we had to deal with. So um, a lot of surgical volume. Number two, you'll be in the clinic. Um, so the GYN clinic, if, if I was in the clinic, that's, that's usually where I was. They do have prenatal clinics and some of the um, local staff will, will help staff those. Lots of opportunities for ultrasounds. Um, they're very, very good with abdominal ultrasounds, but um, not very much pain um, and, and vaginal surge. And I was able to, to do a little bit of teaching with some vaginal ultrasounds. And then the fourth place would be the maternity ward. Um, maternity is pretty much staffed by midwives and, and it pretty much functions on its own. <coughs> They have not had an obstetrician at Greenville for, for quite a while. And so they just get by um, and they'll have a cell and they'll give you a cell phone and they'll call you with questions. Um, and you can either do, I think, all day if you want. Um, if you wanna be called for all of these deliveries, they'll call you and you can kind of customize that and tell them um, exactly what you would like to do out of the experience. Um, the maternity ward is, is honestly one of the places I think as a department, we can make the biggest impact. Um, and, and I know the goal is, is really, not to bring the standards down, I don't think we're up to our, our max rate standards, but um, there's an extremely high rate of IUSD, of intrauterine death, um, of neonatal demise, um, and really staggering and alarming numbers. Um, at one point, I walked onto the ward, and they had four laboring beds, and, and three of the four went into IUSD. And um, these women just are not coming to care, they're not getting care, they have high risk conditions, and um, it's really, really sad. So I think there's a lot that we can do. <coughs> And postpartum trauma is one of the, the big problems there. Go. So the theater, uh, I think this is awesome. When you hear the residents talk about, you need to take the patient to the theater now. Um, they're referring to the operating room. Um, so this is a picture of their main OR. There's two beds. Um, most operating rooms have one, they just have two. And there's a curtain in the middle. And um, this is where you do all your C-sections, a lot of your big cases. Um, the OR functions very similar to, to here, I would say, in, in a lot of the basic functions. Um, I was surprised. I was expecting the conditions to be worse. They have cauteries. The lights do go out. Um, you can't find suture. We ran out of ovitril like on the second day, so you're having to use all kinds of other suture and just really make do um, the best you can. So um, the conditions are different, um, but surprising how much you're able to do in that setting. Um, on the right, picture of the orthopedic um, room. On the left, that's a picture of the surgical ward. So there's 70 beds um, in that ward, separated only by curtains. Uh, patients uh, are side by side. You'll go to do a biannual exam, um, and you drop a curtain, but there's really no privacy. And so you do the best you can. Um, so it's a very, very um, crowded place, tight quarters. Um, and what you don't see there is um, during the night, um, you have 70 
caretakers and family members, and they're spread out under the bed, on the floor, in the aisle. Um, it's very difficult to even get across the room and to see them just facing the table trying to speak to us. Um, so those are the those are the conditions that they're operating under. Dr. Joseph Aguin and Dr. Jim Brown are chief of surgery. Um, they're doing a colorectal case. Here's prepping a patient for surgery. Here's our fibroid uterus. Um, Dr. Joseph and I um, put this lady with nasty, nasty um, fibroids, 24-week size fibroid uterus. Um, they were short-staffed that day, and so um, I was basically their canary in the cage. So chief of surgery would take his head in and out periodically, but um, we got this lady's uterus out, and she um, had bad, bad adhesive disease. We had to do a uterolysis on her ass um, to get her to really pack up. So I was very thankful for the training um, that I've had here so far and um, my surgical experiences of of taking care of this lady was, was invaluable for me, and um, she did well. She left the hospital felt like a queen. Uh, well, here's a Saturday. Um, we were operating, and um, we were coming from, coming from the op base, and I'd scrubbed out for some reason, and then this gentleman in the suit um, from the front desk comes in and says, I'm looking for a surgeon. Um, there is a lady, a Catholic pregnancy, who is bleeding. Um, you must come now. And I didn't know where she was, so I grabbed Dr. Joseph, we ran down to the ODP, which is um, their version of the emergency department and the triage room and the outpatient department. And we saw this lady. She had a pressure of 80 over 50. Um, she had a booklet um, that I'll show you in a second that basically said suspected a Catholic pregnancy, hemoglobin 5, transfer to bingo. And that's what she brought with her. And so we very quickly assessed her. Um, her belly was very tight. Shortly thereafter, she became altered and unresponsive. Her pressure was now 60s over 40, so he took her to the theater. And um, when you opened her belly, um, you would think that a garden hose uh, was just pouring out blood. It just kept coming, kept coming. I didn't know if she'd like pass the aorta. I didn't know what. I was like, where is this blood coming from? Um, it was all blood that had just been pressurized and built up in her abdomen. So um, we tried to pack her off. It kept coming. So we eventually just grabbed her uterus, and she had a ruptured left side with four legs. That's it. And so we just left it there. Picture of Caitlin with BB. Um, so it looked like she had cancer. Um, opened her up and said, Caitlin's BB. We closed it up, got everyone inside PB and legs, and she should get better. Very bad granular vulvar tumor, tumor with some cancer. And um, she must have made her choice. There's a picture of the clinic. Open air clinic. Um, the nurses are very helpful. Um, a third of the patients speak English. A third of the patients speak um, speaking English, and a third of the patients speak French. And so the nurses are very, very helpful. Most of them will speak um, two or at least three of those. And so they're able to help you out with the French if you need it. There's probably about half the patients there that you're able to um, to talk with um, for a fairly good extent. And about half the time you have a major French problem. The prone unit. Um, the red building there, red roof building, is the, our version of ODP. Uh, we call it maternity village. It's four, a four-room building where patients can come with their families and have them stay if they have high-risk pregnancy conditions or if they've come from a long-distance abroad. So I thought that was pretty neat. Maternity room. They do mother baby there. You can see the little baskets on the end of the bed with the addition of a mosquito net. So you can flip them from the floor through. Um, maternal mor mortality is very high. Um, there's one from that um, African country, Sierra Leone, Central Plains. And uh, this is a very interesting stat, I think. You know, in the last um, 20 years, really from 1992 to 2006, there's, there's been very very little of any change in sub-Saharan Africa in terms of births that are attended by skilled personnel. And there have been studies that have been done that have shown um, that this is one of the key prognostic indicators for, for outcomes in fetal outcome as well as maternal outcome. So um, less than half, less than 50% of all births are attended by somebody that they knew at sub-Saharan Africa. So that remains um, a big problem. Picture of the NICU. This is a protocol booklet that Dr. Carroll um, has put together. Um, this is something that she gives you when you go protocols for the hospital, what medicines they use, how to write your op note, um, and really just how to function in the hospital is a very helpful resource. Those are the books that were most helpful to me when I was there and were referenced very frequently. Picture of one of the op notes. Um, all the charts are handwritten, um, written in English, which is very helpful from a medical provider perspective. Um, if you go to some of these hospitals in other parts of the world and your primary language is Spanish or a different language, it's very hard to participate in the care because the language either spoken or written or both um, is not English. So that's one of the neat things about this hospital. You're able to jump in as a resident right away. You're going to do the case. You're going to fix all the patients. You're going to basically be in charge. Um, 
thing you can do is you can you can go to Egypt and you can get your own booklet. Takes me a picture of the patient booklet, which is what they quote with the nurses in medical records. It's very hard to decipher anything that's written. Um, usually it's in English, but it's also text. I mean, here in Alaska it's worse, but this is what the lady with the ectopic organ and all the implants she had. Most of those are just serious. Everything's final and approved. I think Dr. Hammond talked about that. And in these CRNAs, they put in these things like that. They put that thing on, and you are operating on them. It's incredible. It's incredible. Picture of the resident. And that's it. You know, they're didactic, same way. Some pictures around. Doctor, in the, pic in the middle of the picture, um, Dr. Bend. This is Dr. Bend's hat. She was the chief resident with us. She gave me this hat, which I wear proudly. And, um, and I gave him one of mine to leave at the thing. Um, he's also very, very good. And Dr. Higgins also wrote this one, Father Hill. And um, some of the doctors as well. Dr. Dr. Joseph, my buddy. Picture of the ward. Um, for the sake of time, um, I'll skip over some of these boys that you basically tell the kids are really interesting stories. And there's a Catholic kid in there. He's doing incredible work. Um, a lot of skin shots and things that, that really need to be done in those types of accidents. So he's really good for the kids to see. This is Emmanuel, who you saw in the, in the previous picture. He was in the clinic, um, good friends, and somebody I got to know while I was there. And, and but he was one of the happiest boys I've ever seen. And I fell off a motorbike. Um, had his Achilles severed, and the, basically the back half of his leg um, screwed up. And, and he um, underwent surgery, and he was in a much recent hospital. But the care that these folks are receiving is just absolutely incredible. Um, a lot of very gifted and talented doctors have been there in this room. ICU slash PACU. We have two ventilators. Usually at least one of them works. Um, they do their best through ICU care. Um, if somebody gets very sick, um, it, can, it can be very critical for them, and, and it is, it's difficult, but, but they do a really good job. All right. Um, so to close up, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, how we can be involved um, as a group. Um, I definitely, amongst the residents, I really hope that at least one or two of you, especially the Rising Stars viewers, will think about going next year. Um, talk about a little bit about that with your group again. But um, on top of that, what I'd really like to see and kind of a dream and a vision of mine is for us as a department, as the Wayne Health Services Department and as a hospital to get more involved with the hospital electorate um, in our moving way. And so that's where a lot of the nurses um, or our staff come in. And I think there's a lot of um, opportunities. So I want to talk briefly about that as we close out. The needs there are huge um, in terms of education. Um, for a midwife or a nurse, you might go through a, a six-month training period that's exclusively observation. And so you really have never laid hands on a patient, and then you become a midwife or a nurse all of a sudden, and you're put in the midst of these clinical situations. And so um, the care is, is, is very sparse, and it's very limited. And I think there's a lot we can do in terms of education on, on the antepartum unit, on the labor unit, the NICU, um, in terms of the surgery residents. There's a lot of uh, receptivity there. The prisoners love and so as a resident, um, as a four-year resident for this program, we have a lot more experience than they do, and, and especially in the ER and surgery, and there's a lot that we can teach them. There's a lot we can learn from them as well, um, but there's a lot of opportunities to teach them. In particular, I would love to do some laparoscopic surgery training there um, with them so that they can figure that out. They're trying to figure out a lot about um, protocols and procedures, in particular antenatal testing. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, OR supplies is a big need, and, and you guys as a department – very helpful. We took a bunch of stuff with us, um, and that makes a big difference for for the patients there and for the providers there who are able to offer care um, in ways that they wouldn't be able to otherwise. And then staff. So really, I basically said I talked to some of the heads that they, the hospital has, and they basically said we need whoever you can send. Um, you know, as long as we coordinate with them ahead of time, and so this is how many people we've got. Um, they've put together systems and um, the committees in place for for us to jump in and take the lead. For the sake of time, I don't have to skip through this, but um, I spoke about the um, neonatal mortality um, being an issue, um, birth asphyxia in particular. Um, you know, I think this is a big reason why um, a lot of these babies are, are not doing well. Um, they will labor patients for a day, two days, sometimes three days of structured labor. Um, the monitoring there, they go in and assess a patient, and they ask, what are the health trends? And they say, well, they were, they were, you know, 
spend 48 hours right now that are 90, and that's all the information that they have. They really have no knowledge um, on most occasions of how to correlate fetal heart rate with the contractions or with the overall clinical picture of how a patient is doing. Um, and so all they can tell you is the baby's alive, the baby's dead. And so when you deliver a kid, sometimes the baby's alive and sometimes they're dead. And once the baby's dead, that's something that's very common um, in Africa, and, and it happens all the time to a lot of the families in Kenya today. And so um, this isn't something that you're going to change overnight, but I think if we develop a relationship um, over time with the maternity group partner over there, I think there's a lot that we can do very subtly to make some changes, to do some teaching, to do some education that hopefully that would result in um, better outcomes. Um, you can see here the Barba and Hypoxia is over 2 million perineal deaths worldwide and 98% of those are in low-income household, low-income areas like we're talking about. So um, that, that remains a big issue. Some studies um, at a comparable hospital that was in Tanzania. I won't go through it. Um, but it's a interesting table looking at 10,000 deliveries. Of those 10,000 deliveries, only 2.7% of the time was the fetal heart rate um, reported as abnormal. Um, as we, you know, they take this at monitor labor and labor stations all the time. That's not an accurate picture. It's not only 3% of the time that you have an abnormal fetal heart rate. And so um, it's not really being detected. And even if it is, there's a lot of confusion about what to do and how to manage patients who have abnormal fetal heart rate. This is basically looking at um, causes of death in 5,000 deliveries um, involved 49 deaths and 30%, so around 60, 60, excuse me, 66% of those were, were from birth asphyxia. So um, it's not premature to not lay birth weight. If you look at the descriptive statistics of those patients, these are three kilogram kids that come 36 weeks. So these aren't kids who are being born um, in a dying position. These are short 27, 30 weeks. These are term kids or near term kids. Um, and they just don't suffocate. And so um, this remains a problem and something that, that we really need to work on. So how are we going to do it? Um, full development at the hospital. This is a picture of a no-yield monitor. Um, so this is essentially a hybrid between our standard EFM and then a Doppler. And then it kind of functions um, in the middle. And it can record fetal heart rate. And it can record ma uh, maternal heart rate. And then it can change, it has a color code system where if the heart rate is between um, standard parameters, it'll be green. If the heart rate drops below those parameters, uh, it'll turn yellow. If it stays below those parameters for an extended period of time, it turns red and it'll, and it'll go off. So it's a very um, improved way, improved system of trying to monitor these babies in, in low resource areas. And um, you can even push a button and it'll show you a graph of the fetal heart rate baseline over the last 10 minutes. So it's neat, it doesn't really give you much data on variability, um, but it can show you baseline change and, and you can correlate that with contractions and uh, things like that and give you a little bit more information. So we're currently working on a protocol. Um, there's a MFM out of UAB, Dr. Alan Kuda, he's Cameroonian born, and he and Dr. Kiro are working on a protocol and I was able to help them a little bit with that while we were there. So that's something we're trying to figure out is how we can use this and the utility of this moving forward um, in the patient population. So it'll be interesting to see how that shakes out. And this is where I think a lot of the, the nursing education can come in as well. So um, kind of here's, here's my vision and, and here's an idea. Um, I want to get some feedback from you guys, but what I'd like to do over the next two years, you know, we took our first trip this spring. Um, next spring, especially if we can find a resident who wants to take another trip, you know, I'd like to try and get some of the other folks involved. Um, after that, if we can get um, a little bit of momentum, then we could potentially take more than one trip a year, two trips, three trips. <coughs> and then hopefully this is something that we can maintain and keep consistent over the next several years. So what would a, what would a trip look like? like I'm, I'm calling it a multidisciplinary trip. Um, it would look like a resident, probably one or two faculty members, um, a couple nurses from the midst of labor and delivery, postpartum, OPT, and then some of our um, OR folks, whether it's uh, scrub techs, RSAs, um, PRNs, um, getting those people involved as well. I think the key to doing this is, is I'd really like to identify a couple of people that could function on a, a leadership team. I think we're going to need a representative from the OR staff, probably going to need at least one or two representatives from um, the nursing staff to really say this is something that um, I feel strongly about that I want to be a part of. And what I'd like to do is if there are those people out there, I'd like those people to be the first ones to go <coughs> and then to come back 
and be able to potentially lead a trip, maybe a mission trip, or maybe a trip with some of our AI staff later on. Um, I've gotten overwhelming support um, from a lot of our folks um, in the department, and we had several here today, and several more on the ambassador interest, and um, that's so encouraging for me. Um, I think the trick is going to be how do we do this um, strategically and correctly, and, and I think identifying some key people who are willing to commit to taking the trip each year for the next two to three years, I think that's the first step. So, um, so that's what we're looking for. <coughs> By five years, um, my goal would be to take, uh, have taken at least four residents, including at least six residents, at least four faculty members, and at least 20 um, people from our support staff, and, and be taking three trips a year. So um, we'll, see, we'll see what we can do. Um, this is a letter from the chief of surgery. I won't read it. Um, basically, it talks about postpartum hemorrhage and how they have one Bakri balloon. For the last year, they've had one Bakri balloon that they've um, pulled sterilized and reused. Um, tells the story of a lady who died. Um, they ended up proceeding to hysterectomy, but it was too late. And um, having, if they could have had the Bakri balloon available earlier, that could have made a difference in her intensive unit following up. We were able to take six Bakri balloons um, because of the support of you guys um, in the department, um, as well as um, a lot of other supplies. So what you guys are doing makes a difference. And um, I just don't wanna, I don't wanna underestimate that in, in our mission to advance on um, to solve the Bakri issue. We feel two suitcases um, full of medical supplies in our unit. There's your um, central cost estimate for all of your AR equipment. So why go um, to wrap things up? The hospital is extremely unique. Hopefully you've gotten a taste of that. This place is one of my very few places in the world. Um, the people there, the residents, the nursing staff, they're amazing. They're some of the happiest people you've ever met. Um, your life will be changed if you get to meet them and work with them. It truly will. There's lots of needs. I think we've talked about that. Um, is a chance to leave a legacy. Um, you know, don't forget David Thompson and his story with the PACS program and how he realized that um, his life was more about just his career and he wanted to build something that was gonna go beyond that. And I, I think that's something that we all need to think about and strive to do. Um, it's very safe. Um, the CDC, like I said, takes great care of you. This is a place that Hannah and I would, would take our kids and we'd send them to. Um, once you get to the hospital, it's very remote. Um, honestly, you're probably the biggest danger in our political climate currently is traveling to these vessels or trailers for a place like that. I think once you get to the, to the country itself, I think you're gonna be fine. Um, English, the written and spoke, spoken language are huge. Lots of opportunities for professional and personal development. And then again, to whom much is given, um, you'll enter that saying as much is required. And so with the gifts that we have, with the training we have, the question now is what are we gonna do with it? And that's kind of what I wanna leave you with. So what does it look like? Um, you're looking at about $3,000 to take a trip like this. 1,500 of that's in airfare, roughly 500 in shots and immunizations, and then about another 1,000 in room and board. We went for a three-week trip. Um, Hannah was there for 10 days, Dr. Higgins for two weeks. Um, and really, you know, for the residents, you've gotta commit to at least three or four weeks. Um, for some of our other folks, I think that you're gonna commit to probably two weeks, because um, you're gonna you know, eat up about two, two and a half days either way with travel. Um, I think that's what you're looking at. Um, infectious concerns, um, yellow fever vaccines required, malaria prophylaxis is recommended. Um, there's really that one day when you're in Douala, which is at sea level where you have some mosquitoes, um, but you're on prophylaxis. Once you get up to the higher altitudes, um, the hospital's about a mile high. Um, there's virtually no mosquitoes and the, the malaria pro or the malaria risk is extremely small. Um, in the OR, about 230% of the patients do have HIV, so you have to be very careful. They do have close exposure prophylaxis there. Um, other safety concerns, like I said, the CDC takes good care of you. Um, there is a little bit of unrest in the northern part of the country, <coughs> um, but th that's very, very far away from this um, particular region. Um, Cameroon by itself has been one of the most peaceful countries on the African continent um, for going on 20 years. Um, my current president has been um, in his position for 38 years, but some people um, within the country travel to Cameroon and try to move to Cameroon for that reason. For residents, Americans First um, International Relief Organization does offer resident assistance funds for grants that you can apply for. Um, so I would encourage you guys to do that. I did not know about this um, until um, until we'd already left the airport, but I found out about it when we were getting off. Other logistics, um, in terms of legal logistics, we have an affiliation agreement that my dad has put through and Subjoy has been a big, big part of that. So um, legally we are clear to go. Um, 
for the residents as well. It's, it's approved through the department um, and through Dr. Higgins. Um, you would have her do that there. And then the other legal things, um, Tenane does not currently require malpractice coverage um, for you, which is nice. And then um, oh, going back to funding, I didn't mention this, but uh, Meta has also approved that you can now use that $19 hundred dollar of, of Tenane money towards travel for a trip like this in place of a contract fee for the trip. So um, that's huge. Um, you can get to that $3,000 pretty quick um, by using that money this year. In terms of the, ti the timing, um, you've got to start, start planning this about 16 months in advance. So if there are any of you guys who want to go from the resident side you know, by early fall, I think we need to try and get something on the books as far as <coughs> you know, the chief of surgery has said um, that he, he wants us to go and wants to accommodate us as much as he can, but he just has to manage. These residents do come from, from all over the country to spend time. So um, if there's a time that, that you like that works good for you, we need to try and, and plan that down and get it going. I put all this information on the O drive uh, for the residents and all the paperwork. I'd be more than happy to walk you through that. Here's some pictures of, there's a bunch of hiking while we were there. Dr. Higgins jumped over a creek, it was awesome. see the contrast between the wet and the dry season. One of the hikes, one of the coolest hikes we've been on there. One of the, one of the highest points around in the hospital. So um, food for thought, who's gonna go? And that's kind of really what I, I wanna figure out. And, and I want um, you guys to let me know if you have an interest um, from the nursing side and some of our support staff. Um, I, we wanna know who would have an interest in going, who would have an interest in, in giving up two weeks of their PTO, $3,000, um, that's a big commitment. I know um, we've talked to a couple of faculty members who might be interested, but uh, hopefully we can get several of our faculty members over to Tenane in the next couple of years because you guys have so much to offer when it comes to teaching and training, and, and it was an invaluable experience to go um, with Dr. Higgins and, and learn, um, and so I'm, I'm so thankful that he was willing to go with us. In terms of how many people, um, my thought would be to take maybe six to eight people this next trip if there was that much interest and if the hospital could accommodate us, um, we just have to see. And I think there's a lot of follow-up conversations that we need to have about what we're gonna do while we're there, what the focus is gonna be, how are we gonna approach some of these education components um, with some of the up-and-coming hospital workers. Where they were gonna go, um, would probably be next spring, um, but I don't know exactly when, how long, probably looking at about two weeks. And then um, I've talked to several of you about your significant others going, and I definitely think that's a possibility. Uh, it just does depend on, again, how much room they have for us and, and, and what we're trying to do. So tons of possibilities, tons of opportunities. It's gonna be hard work. We can do it. We're gonna have to be resourceful. It's just a picture of some, some workers that we met and their own decisions. And so um, just to, to wrap things up, um, please, 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 if you have an interest, let me know. Um, I would love to, um, to try and make this possible and, and, and try to make something that our make something our department does um, moving forward in the next couple of years. So um, I really appreciate your feedback. Um, I know we've gone a little bit over, but um, now or um, later, just slide me a note, send me an email if you have ideas about how we can get this done, and I'd love to hear it. So I'm just gonna open it up for questions, comments, or concerns before we, before we wrap it up.